This is Legacy Battle. Make sure you hit that subscribe button on YouTube, Amazon Music, Spotify, Apple, iHeartRadio, Podnods, whatever you're listening on. Hit that subscribe button. I am Michael Adams, creator of Legacy Battle. My panelists tonight from the Gridiron Battle Zone, Brian King from Steelers Nation South, Rollo Coffin. And we got from a whole bunch of Packers places, Walter <laughs> Williams, his first time aboard. So we're happy to have him in here. Our special guest tonight, we're joined by a former wide receiver and returner, played with the Los Angeles Express of the USFL, and then his entire NFL career with the New York Jets, where he'd be top 10 in punt and kick returns and yardage. He's 144th all-time in combined kicking and punt return yards. In 1988, he was the first team all-conference. We got JoJo Townsell. JoJo, thank you for joining us. All right, thanks for having me. Awesome. As always, we're going to have our Q&A after for JoJo. Tonight's debate is the top five New York Jets offensive skilled positions. We were throwing linemen in here. There's quite a few good linemen in uh, Jets history. So we're going to keep it to the skilled positions. And we're going to start out tonight with Curtis Martin. Yeah, so Curtis Martin, uh, man, this man had a very impressive career. Uh, he was a three-time All-Pro. He went to the Pro Bowl five times. He averaged four yards per carry over his career. And he took great care of the football, only fumbling the ball 29 times with touch with 4,000 plus touches. He had double digit touchdowns in four of his seasons. He broke 1,000 yards rushing in 10 of 11 seasons. And the one season that he didn't break it, he missed four games and missed 1,000 yards by 300 yards. He also won Offensive Rookie of the Year. He was Offensive Player of the Year. And he was actually one of the first running backs that that I actually closely follow um, as I, you know, got deeper and deeper into football. So Curtis Martin to me is one of the greatest uh, Jets offensive players of all time. As a, a University of Pittsburgh graduate, I'm loving some Curtis Martin too. So I'm just going to throw <laughs> that out there. <laughs> Jojo, let me come to you. Your, your thoughts on Curtis Martin. I mean, it, 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 it taints him a little bit, in my opinion, that he played for the Patriots, but you know, <laughs> that's neither here nor there. What are, you, what are your thoughts on Curtis Martin? Um, well, Curtis simply, uh, just like Walter kind of mentioned, um, uh, he was the epitome of consistency. And, uh, you know, when you're a Hall of Fame type of player that he was, um, you know, he did it at an elite level. So you knew what you were getting. Uh, there wasn't a defense that could stop him. Um, he was also one of the things that uh, aren't talked about enough. Uh, he was a, you know, he was a good uh, pass catcher out of the backfield. So he was all around back. I mean, obviously blocked well. So every aspect of being an NFL running back, he did it at a high level. Uh, very consistent. Wasn't that flashy, but, you know, just as the statistics show, I mean, when the year ended, I mean, he was always one of the tops in every category of being a running back. Right. Brian, what is he at, fifth or sixth all-time in yardage? He's got to be. Yeah, yeah, he's, yeah, he's right up there. I'm not sure if it's fifth or sixth now, but, yeah, he's, he's right up there. Right above Bettis, if I'm recalling correctly. So, well, let's move to our other running back tonight, Freeman McNeil. All right, Freeman McNeil, 5'11", 216 running back. Uh, 12 seasons with the Jets. Um, now, Freeman McNeil, he did not have the greatest open field speed, uh, but he was able to find and hit rushing lanes as well as anyone. Uh, he was a slashing, you know, driven type runner. Uh, the New York Times once described his running style this way. He gets the ball. He's swallowed up by a swarm of tacklers. You don't see him, and then you do. He emerges from the pile and scampers forward. McNeil is a survivor. Uh, his ability to make something out of nothing helped him find much early success in his career. His second season in the NFL, he led the league in both rushing yards and average yards per carry, a scorching 5.2 average that year. Uh, in the years that followed, he twice topped 1,000 yards with a high mark of 1331 in 1985. Uh, unfortunately, injuries eventually slowed him down, but he became the Jets' all-time rushing leader, a record which Curtis Martin eventually broke in 2004. Uh, he also influenced the NFL in another way. Uh, he was involved in a case against the league, which ultimately paved the way for free agency. So a great running back, a great Jet, an influential man, Freeman McNeil. Georgia, one stat he didn't mention was 45 fumbles. That is a lot of turnovers. 
I mean, how, how badly does that stall your offense? And if you had to pick between him and Curtis, who would you be taking? <laughs> well, that, that's, that's real difficult because, uh, you know, Freeman and I go back a long ways. Uh, we played together at UCLA also. And, uh, you know, Freeman, um, to me, he was the type of back that just wasn't appreciated. He wasn't appreciated at UCLA, wasn't appreciated with the Jets. And what I mean by that is that um, outside of his earlier career, you know, he wasn't ever really featured the way um, being a teammate that I thought he could have been, where he could have actually uh, made more of an impact with our team and with our season. Uh, we did have some other talent at running back, but, you know, Freeman, uh, and, and I'm being biased here, um, he was always a, a favorite of mine as a teammate. Uh, he, he was great in the locker room. Uh, but yeah, the fumbles, he, he did have some issues with fumbles. Um, and, uh, and obviously, if you're going to compare the two, I mean, obviously, Curtis had a much better prolific uh, NFL career than, than Freeman did. But if there's one thing I can uh, attest, to, you know, attest to Freeman, and this was before I came to the Jets, it was that one year that the Jets made it to the, uh, to the championship game against Miami. And a big reason why that and why I said that if, if Freeman was, uh, you know, the, the number one option on your offense, he was the number one option of that offense at that time. You know, Richard Todd was the quarterback. They had a great team. Uh, and they were probably favored going into Miami that year. And the reason why they lost the, uh, the AFC, AFC championship, because there was a big thunderstorm in Miami the day before, and the Dolphins, you know, uh, suspiciously, did not cover the turf. <laughs> they did that on purpose because they knew they could not stop the Jets running game. And so a lot of that had to do with Freeman. So Freeman had the type of impact as, as you want with a running back that could get you to the big game because he did, he was the featured back that year, a big reason why the Jets made it to the AFC championship game. And if not for a you know, little mother nature, who knows, they might've made the Super Bowl. Inside information there. I always love that. Let's uh, let's move to the outside here. Let's go wide receivers. We'll start it out with Wesley Walker. Wesley Walker. Uh, Cyclops, as he was known, because he played <laughs> most of his career. Almost he played his entire career. He was blind, legally blind in his left eye. So <clears throat> and um, he was one of the best deep threats coming out of college of, out of Cal. Uh, he averaged 25.7 yards per catch coming out of Cal. Uh, and drafted second round, 33rd overall by the Jets. <clears throat> and he took that prowess that he showed in, in Cal as, as a deep threat, and he instantly made an impact in the NFL. He averaged 41.1 um, yards per catch his first year and 24.7 yards per catch his second year. Uh, the second year, he was his first 1,000-yard campaign. Uh, injuries kind of hampered him over the next four seasons. He missed 23 games, but he still averaged – 19 and a half yards per catch in, in, in those seasons where he missed all that time. So if he had played, uh, you know, half those games, his numbers would be uh, far more substantial. Um, four of his five final five seasons, he averaged over 20 yards per catch, including a second to last year. He had a second thousand yard season where he uh, went over 1,200 yards and had his first season with 10 plus touchdowns. Uh, for his career, he averaged a ridiculous 19 yards per catch. <clears throat> He's second in Jets history in receiving yards and touchdowns, TD receptions, third in receptions. Uh, also has the longest receiving touchdown in Jets history with a 96-yard uh, catch and run uh, against Buffalo. Uh, and he's also the only offensive skill player in Jets history who also has a safety. So, uh, so he's, a 2000, he's a 2012 member of the Jets uh, Hall of Honor. Wesley Walker, put that man on that top five list. <laughs> Walker had the speed, he could play in the slot. I mean, he wasn't your prototypical wide receiver. You know, so what are your thoughts on Walker? And, and his size was didn't have the statue where he's going to be jumping over people, but the man could catch the ball. He can catch the ball. And, uh, yeah, I mean, he had the breakaway speed. Um, what was uh, crazy with Wesley was that, I mean, he had a, a knee injury, I think his third or fourth year in the league. And so the latter half of his career, I mean, he, 
he basically played with one eye and one knee <laughs> and still outrunning everybody. Um, he is the only player that I've seen live that, you know, could catch a ball. I don't care how where you threw it, how far you threw it down the field, but he would go get it. And I've never seen anyone with that kind of, you know, catch, uh, you know, catch the ball uh, speed. They just can just get to that ball and, and make a big play happen. Uh, about the only other person was our other teammate was, uh, you know, Lamb Jones, who unfortunately had a injury prone season. And obviously he was an Olympic sprinter too, but, um, you know, a, a quick funny story is that, I mean, when I got drafted by the Jets in 83 and, and came to the, uh, our preseason camp, uh, you know, I got to see those guys in action and, you know, get to the point. Uh, that's why I selected to just stay in LA and go to the express and said, you know, I'm not going to mess with these guys. <laughs> they're, they are awesome. But I, I think with one thing, uh, two things that aren't talked about with Wesley is his toughness. Um, he had no problem coming across the middle. He had awesome hands. I mean, he had glue for hands. He could, I mean, he would get in there and he could be a possession receiver. And when he was asked to do so, he did it at, at a high level. Um, and, uh, and probably the biggest thing is just that, I mean, he just opened up our offense because, again, because of his speed, he was kind of like, you know, Tyreek Hill with the Chiefs right now. I mean, he would just open it up for the rest of the offense in the passing game just because the threat that he possessed. I mean, the DBs, uh, they weren't bumping and running Wesley very often, so they were playing off quite you know, quite a lot, so that opened up a lot of holes for our offense. So we're going to go to Al Toon next. Then. So I got Al Toon, and I'm not going to – I'm not going to sit here and tell you that he's probably better than the other wide receivers we're talking about tonight. Altoon for me was a pick that was just the guy that I really liked. Much like when we did the Jets defense show with John Abraham, I took Eric McMillan. I knew he wasn't going to make the top five, but I just a player that I loved. So Altoon played from 85 to 92, his whole career with the Jets. He's got three Pro Bowls. Um, he's on that Jets all-time four-decade team. Uh, he does have the least amount of turnovers by a wide receiver tonight. So that's the one thing I can brag on him. He's holding on to the ball. Uh, he led the league in receptions in 1988, four times in the top 10, three times top 10 in yards. So for his short time period that he did play, he was pretty dominant. Him and Ken O'Brien had a nice combination going there. His career, unfortunately, was very shortened by concussions. Uh, I had read that he had nine concussions in eight years. And this is back, and we're talking 85 to 92, before we really knew what was going on with concussions. I have a feeling he would have been shut down a lot earlier in his career um, if this was today. So, um, yeah, he, he he's barely top five on the wide receiver list in, in the statistics for the Jets because his career was so short. But during that time period that he was there, he was dominant. JoJo, I mentioned the concussions. I mean – it was definitely different back then. Do you think with that amount of concussions, they would have shut him down in today's game? And and had he played longer, what do you think he could have done? Well, yeah, he definitely would have been shut down um, and might have even had to end his career even earlier because um, he took a lot of abuse and uh, because that was the only way to defend him. I mean, he's 6'4", 220, and uh, unguardable, run great, run great routes. Um, and uh, but the way to defend him was is just when he caught the ball, they were just going to converge and just try to knock the crap out of him as best they could. And unfortunately, you know, if there's one thing I can say, you know, rest in peace, our coach Joe Walton. You know, I always tell people that ever ask, Joe Walton to me was one of the you know, top offensive minds in in NFL. Um, we were way ahead of the game with some of the things we did, and a lot had to do with him. Um, the downfall was that sometimes he forgot how, <laughs> how smart he could be, and we got pretty predictable as an offense. And the reason why I bring that out is because, I mean, he typecast the talent that we had. You have an Al Toon, 
six four that can run a four four five that can jump that can dunk a basketball at twelve feet. This dude, he should not have been a possession receiver. He, we should have been talking to him the way we're talking about with Wesley Walker. You know, the statistic to see with Al or the disappointing statistic would be is how many touchdowns over 40 yards did Al have in his career? Because he should have had just as many as Wesley with the ability and the jumping ability that he had. And I think those are one of the things that um, when I look back on our team, particularly with Al, that we didn't use that aspect of that combination of size, speed, and talent enough down the field. And so when you talk about his concussions, teams were just lining up because they knew a lot of times they were, we were using him as a possession receiver. So he's going 10 to 15 yards and those linebackers were looking for him. <laughs> and back in the day, I mean, let's, let's be honest, you're trying to knock people out. OK, and one way to destroy our offense, knock Al Toon out of the game. <laughs> OK, and that that was the mindset is we're going to we're going to make sure that he felt us at the end of the day. And again, I go back to this. I, I alluded to Wesley, Al's toughness. I, I saw him take some shots from some big time, you know, defensive linemen, linebackers. I mean, right up under the chin. And he would just get up ready for the next play. I mean, he, uh, you can say to the concussion, he probably had more. But because of the type of player and the commitment that he had with our team and to himself and, and trusting his ability, you know, he, uh, he, he kept battling in there. If he had the, the space that they have today, I think he'd be putting up like Megatron numbers. But We'll, well never know. remember too, <laughs> uh, not to cut you off, Brian. No, no. You gotta remember too, back in the day when they were talking about wide receivers, they were saying number one, Jerry Rice, number two, Al Toon. Okay, so that that's all you need to know about Al Toon. If they're comparing him to Jerry Rice when Jerry Rice was at his peak, that's all you need to know about Al Toon. He's making an argument for me. I love it. Well, let's move on <laughs> to uh Don Maynard. <laughs> Yeah, so Don Maynard, he uh he began his career. He's, so he's, he did one year in the NFL before heading to the CFL for one year. Um, then he came back to the NFL, and he started off his, his tenure with the Jets with a bit of a makeshift quarterback lineup before Joe Namath came along. Um, in his first five years prior to Joe Namath uh, with a makeshift quarterback lineup, he managed to have 2,000-plus uh, yard receiving seasons. Um, and you know he he was he was one of those players that that kept the that kind of kept the team in games you know despite in spite of how the quarterback play were was but then once Joe Namath came on board that's when when this guy really you know hit his peak he averaged uh, at least twenty yards per reception in four of his seasons played he was uh, number one he was number one in all time yardage in New York Jets history by more than three thousand yards. He is a four-time All-Pro. He tied the league in um, the league lead in receiving touchdowns in 1965. He was tied for that, and he led the league in receiving yards in 67. He retired as one of the only five players with 50 receptions and 1,000 yards in five seasons at the time he retired. And his biggest moment, they say legends are born in the playoffs, right? Maynard may have had his best performance in the 1968 AFL championship game against Oakland where he hauled in six receptions for 118 yards and two scores to upset the to upset Oakland in the 27 to 23 game which took them to the Super Bowl that they eventually won. So Don Maynard, you know, the biggest thing about him or the thing that stood out the most about him for me is how he managed to managed to still stay on board or you know keep things afloat before Joe Namath came. But, you know, we we know how valuable quarterbacks are in this league and once Joe Namath came, that boy hit the hit the ground running and took the uh, league by storm. So Don Maynard definitely deserves consideration for the top five. JoJo, today's NFL is it's a passing league. How does Maynard, what is this, 50 years later, still have all the receiving records for the Jets? How is this possible? <laughs> um, good question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can't explain it, but, uh, you know, I mean – Fortunately, you know, he uh, 
he had a lot of Hall of Fame talent around him, Super Bowl championship winning talent around him. So that made a big difference. And as Walter alluded to, I mean, he was doing this before they got to that point of being uh, Super Bowl contenders. Um, but probably the biggest thing you could say when we were talking about um, some of the other guys, especially my teammates, Wesley and, and Al, um, is durability. I mean, the game, uh, the game was rough back then. And particularly for wide receivers, I mean, back then you had to bump and run coverage where the guys could bump you until the ball was up in the air. And uh, we're talking about some mean teams back then, you know, between the Raiders and the Dolphins and the Chiefs, who all had great defenses, particularly some awesome and Hall of Fame type uh, defensive backs. It's the punishment that the receivers had to take at that time was a lot more than e even now, just because, I mean, you could rock a dude <laughs> back then. <laughs> Just take them all out of the the, 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 the whole pattern and it wouldn't be a flag. I mean, as you guys know now, all you got to do is touch somebody and you throw a flag. But these guys were getting rocked back then and stuff that you wouldn't be able to see on television. <laughs> so his durability, particularly back in that time, and particularly with those teams, the teams we're talking about are Super Bowl championship teams from the Raiders, the Chiefs, the Dolphins during that time. And he's having to play against these guys. And for him to play for, um, for such a long time and uh, staying in the game and playing at such a high level, I mean, that's why he's a Hall of Fame player. Let's go George Sauer. All right, another old school Jet. Uh, he was six foot two, 195, another wide receiver. Uh, he, he was only with the Jets from 65 to 70, short career. Uh, he had a rather interesting story. I mean, on the football field, he quickly became one of the best receivers in you know, the AFL. That was the AFL then. Um, he was named to the AFL All-Star team in four consecutive seasons from 66 to 69. And he topped 1,000 yards in three straight seasons during an era which usually only saw a handful of receivers reach that plateau per year. So that's rather impressive. In 66, he had the second most receptions, fourth most yards league-wide. 67, the most receptions, second most yards. 68, second most receptions, third most yards. And he was still in the top 10 in both categories in 69. Uh, he showed up big time in Super Bowl three. Actually had a pretty good argument. He probably could have won the MVP. He had eight catches for 133 yards. That was 65% of the total yards that Namath passed for that entire game. Uh, but Sauer decided to leave the game of football while, while he was still in his prime. Uh, he became disillusioned with the, the way that Coach Eubank would, ran things and really like the entire industry in general. Um, this was long before free agency, so he, you know, he couldn't just pick another team or anything like that. So he just walked away altogether. Uh, yet his contributions to the Jets prior to uh, walking away really makes him uh, you know, a, a good candidate for this list. So uh, another old school wide receiver here, played in the hard days, walking away from the game at a young age. Uh, JoJo, I mean that that back then that was their that was their livelihoods. That was how they made their money. And he walks away. I mean, what what are your thoughts on a player doing that in the middle of their career? And and what are your thoughts on on George? Um, well, I, I can kind of <laughs> relate to George a little bit because it's it's a little bit why I I kind of you know, decided to stop playing myself. Um, you know, you, when you have those kind of moments where you're, you feel that you're not getting the most out of the game. And uh, when you talk about someone like George, though, that was, like you said, uh, just one of the, you know, top receivers uh, during that time. Um you know, I look at George the same way with Curtis Martin. I mean, he was just uh, the model of consistency at a high level. And, uh, you know, it wasn't anything, you know, that flashy or anything about it. It's just he just knew how to get the job done, dependable. Um, and you knew that you can count on him to make the big play when it was needed. And, 
Um, but for him to leave, it had to take something, you know, pretty, pretty strong for him to leave, especially at that time when the Jets, again, were, were right there as far as being championship contenders. So um, all I can say is that um, I'm sure it's a decision that uh, he took long and hard and thought it was best for him to make at that time. Well, our final wide receiver tonight, Wayne Corbett. Wayne Corbett. So <clears throat> most most of the, the football world known as Ray, uh, Wayne Corbett, but those who played the game knew him as Mr. Third Down. And we will touch on that in just a little bit here. Um, <clears throat> he was Hofstra's first 1,000-yard first third, first third receiver and the career leader in career touchdown receptions. He also tied Jerry Rice's 1AA record of touchdown receptions in a game with five. But despite that, his success in college, he was deemed too small to play in the NFL. So he went undrafted, uh, but he did secure a tryout with the Baltimore Stallions of the CFL, but they cut him after one day. So he secured a tryout with the Jets. He actually went into uh, training camp as the 11th receiver on the depth chart. You know, back in those days, only five or four or five receivers made the, the roster. Um, but he was able to battle through training camp in preseason and secure a spot on the uh, Jets 53-man roster. But because he was fifth, we going into training camp in preseason and into the regular season, he took off. His first year, he was 27th in the league in receptions. And the next year, he was 13th in the league in receptions. Those two totals helped him at the time become the fast, the, uh, the, the person with the most receptions over their first two seasons. Um, <clears throat> he, but he made his name on third down. He was known as Mr. Third Down. So 65% of his receptions came on third down and secured a first down. 71% of his receptions were for either a touchdown or a first down. So that's, that's ridiculous. You can't beat those numbers. He's third all-time in Jets history in receiving yards. He's second all-time in receptions, third all-time in receiving touchdowns. And to sum up his career, because you know his, his career was cut short because of concussions, in his final game against the San Diego Chargers, he caught a pass on, on third down for a first down at the two-minute warning, which helped to secure the drive longer. They didn't win the game, but it helped secure the drive longer so they could have an attempt to win the game. They didn't, but that was his final catch, a first down off a third down reception. Um, he's, a, he's a 2014 Jets Ring of uh, Honor member, and his jersey had been unofficially retired. Uh, by the Jets. Nobody has worn the jet, his jersey since he retired in 2005. Mm -hmm. And so go ahead and put Ray Wayne Corbett on the top five. Go ahead and do it. So we all know Wayne Corbett because we know football and we are into football. But if I was to ask, like, the casual fan, they're not going to know Mr. Third Down. They're not going to know Possession Receiver. But they're going to know T.O. They're going to know Randy Moss. They're going to know the guys that make the splash plays. Jojo, just saying that, I'm feeling like Wayne doesn't get enough respect. Well, I agree with that. And what's, uh, what makes your point um, um, accentuated even more is that it's just a story behind it. There's more Wayne Corbett stories out there in the NFL, you know, than there are the, the number one pick in the draft. Uh, having a successful career and uh, you know to to play to play this game I mean I, I kind of laugh I mean I you know I went to the Super Bowl this year and got to see a lot of former teammates and and some and some other NFL colleagues and I always kind of laugh and I see the size of these guys and you know they're up there saying Wayne Wayne Corbett was too small I mean wasn't Wayne Corbett bigger than I was <laughs> <laughs> I know when I'm looking at them, I was hanging out with some of these guys, some of the, you know, linemen and things of that nature. And I'm like, you know, what the heck was I thinking being <laughs> out there? But, uh, you know, but I'd say 75% of the guys that play in NFL, and I mean the history of it, it's an attitude. I mean, you're in some kind of zone because I, I've, I, I've lived it. And it's a kind of zone just that just attracts, the attraction is the love for the game. Uh, being out there, and uh, I tell you, there's nothing like uh, 
playing football in New York. I tell you that that's uh, that's an experience and a half to be out there on on the field and you know eighty thousand people uh, out there and just just the the whole environment of of being a New York Jet is is just something that uh, uh, you you wish everyone could live through just to have that experience and and I think that's what drove Wayne. And if we uh, appreciate the thing with Wayne is that um, he wasn't going to take no for an answer. He was going to prove himself because the passion that he had for the game and the belief he had in himself. So um, we all play the game. I mean, it's great that you can make some money and, and do all these other things. But first and foremost, I mean, it's the love of the game that why you, that is the big attraction. And uh being able to compete with the best athletes in the world on a weekly basis. I mean, uh, that's what keeps someone like a Wayne Corbett to, to keep going until he got his chance. And, you know, when that door opened, he was going to make sure it wasn't going to close till he said so. Well, let's move on to our final player tonight. And I guarantee he makes the top five. Guaranteed. Joe Namath, Broadway Joe. Jets all-time passing leader in yards and touchdowns, 1965, Rookie of the Year. He's got five Pro Bowls. We'll call him that. I think they have different, different, <laughs> different league back then. But uh, he led the league in just about all passing quick categories at least once in a season. Um, he's two-time AFL Player of the Year. In 74, he got the Comeback Player of the Year. Um, he's on the um, – the AFL Hall of Fame All 1960s team. Of course, he is the MVP of the Super Bowl in 1968, uh, and that was obviously the you know the Jets' only Super Bowl appearance, and of course, victory. Um, you know, stats stats aren't going to be what people remember Joe Namath for. They all remember him for the same thing: the, the guarantee of the Super Bowl win. Um, you know, over the Colts, Johnny Unitas Colts. You know this. It took guts to do that, especially when you're you're playing in New York, where everything is magnified a hundred times larger than what it is anywhere else. JoJo, if he goes on to lose that game, are we talking about Joe Namath tonight? <laughs> um, that's a good question, but I, I still think you'd be talking about Joe Namath because he, uh, if there's one thing, his talent changed the game. I mean, it was the first time uh, that a quarterback can demonstrate the importance of the forward pass and not just throwing, you know, uh, stop routes, you know, five, 10 yard routes, but how, you know, bringing the, the deep game uh, was essential to the progression of NFL football. And uh, he did it with such ease. I mean, his throwing ability was just uncanny. Um, uh, I mean, just the way I mean, it was, he had a cannon for her arm. You just see it and he's barely throwing the ball and it goes 40 yards. And he just did it with such ease, with such accuracy. Um, you know, the only one I, I felt that had the same attitude was him, uh, was, was Dan Marino. I had that same kind of attitude that just, I do not care what the defense is saying. <laughs> I'm going to fit this ball right through there and then say, you know, I'm going to get the job done. So um, his talent, um, you know, showed what could happen, you know, where we're at today with the NFL, particularly with the passing game. And, you know, he demonstrated that, as, you know, starting in 65. And uh, again, I think he was a big reason why the passing game continued to mature uh, just because he was the blueprint of what could happen with the forward pass. Um, and secondly, again, the attitude. I mean, it was that attitude, him guaranteeing the Super Bowl win, and just the flair, the confidence that he gave his team. I mean, if you want to compare what he gave the Jets the, uh, those years, I mean, you can compare it to Tom Brady. You know, that attitude, knowing that, you know, we got him on our side, which means we got a chance to win. And that's what he gave the Jets, um, you know, during his prime uh, and those, those, those years. And, uh, um, that, you know, that says a lot. I mean, because he made people better. And just to show that I'm a fair host, I brought up McNeil's fumbles. I'm going to bring up Namath's uh, interceptions here. 215 interceptions with the Jets to only 170 touchdowns. 
So just keeping it all even out there. So, all right. So we're going to move into our vote, our, our shout outs tonight. Matt Schnell, Ken O'Brien, Mickey Schuler just missed our list tonight. So, Walter, you're in my top corner. Can't pick your own. Everybody gets to take one tonight. Uh, for me, I got to go with my pick would be Wayne Corbett. Okay. Brian. Well, I mean, one, one thing you didn't mention about, about Joe Namath was, I mean, that whole, like, superstar, you know, sex symbol thing he had going on. Really, like, the first <laughs> – probably like you know football player like just be bigger than life you know it's so I gotta get Joe Namath man what, wasn't he like Al Bundy's bartender or something and very much <laughs> <laughs> all right David. Rollo it, it just that Joe Namath the one of the funniest moments of television was when he hit on Susie Colbert on the side <laughs> <laughs> that was funny <laughs> yeah. but my pick is going to be Don Maynard simply because his records still stand to this day. He hasn't played in well over 45-plus years. So put Don Maynard on that top top five. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go Curtis Martin, and not just because he went to Pitt, uh, but he's the all-time leading rusher on the Jets. How can we not have their all-time leading rusher on this list? So, JoJo, we come to you. You got Al Toon, George Sauer, Freeman McNeil, Wesley Walker. Out of those four? Out of those four, yep. Whoa. You get the hard part. <laughs> yeah, you're not kidding, because it'll, you know, you know, off the record, I, I gotta say Joe Namath's number one just because um you know he he brought the championship to the Jets. <laughs> you know, to me that <laughs> who cares about the stats? I mean, it's all about winning in the NFL. You know, he was the one, he was the leader of bringing a championship to the New York Jets franchise. But out of those four, um, gee whiz, I would, uh, I'd probably have to, you know, go with Altoon um, simply because of, um, of what he was able to achieve while he played. And still, as I alluded to earlier, um, uh, unfortunately, as as a team, we did not capitalize on all of his ability. Hmm. And if we had of, and if he could have stayed healthy, which I think it would have helped him stay healthy, um, you know, uh, he could possibly be the, the number one, you know, Jets of all time. So our New York Jets offensive skill positions, top five of all time, Joe Namath, Altoon, Wayne Corbett, Don Maynard, Curtis Martin. We're going to move into our Q&A. Walter, you got two on the list. You get first question. Oh, wow. Okay. So, <laughs> um, so the question I have for you now, again, I'm, this is my first time doing this. So are we asking this specific to that career or just general questions? Ask them anything you want. Okay. <laughs> so my question for you is with how the wide receiver market is looking today with every every other day you hear about a new player possibly getting a new contract to one up the other player, the wide receiver market now is almost looking like quarterbacks. What are your thoughts on that? And do you do you feel do you feel that wide receivers deserve to be paid like quarterbacks right now? Um That's a good question. I uh, I believe so. I mean, you know, obviously the quarterbacks. I mean, I mean they are the most important, but you know they have to have someone to play with. And uh, if there's anything I'm glad about is that you know linemen are getting their just due and they're getting paid. But I think uh, the way the game has changed and the way the NFL has wanted to conform to providing more entertainment there's no greater entertainment than watching a quarterback throw a ball to a receiver and whether they do a catch and run or they do a 60 yard seven yard uh, bomb I mean that is the most exciting play maybe outside of a, a special teams play a kickoff you know punt return but on a straight offense I mean it doesn't get more exciting than that I mean sure you can have a great running back you know 
do some things, but the way the, I mean, they changed the rules for a reason. They wanted to see more offense and, um, and everyone has understood that. And that's why we're a pass heavy NFL uh, with our offenses, you know, the running backs, they haven't come obsolete, but you know, they haven't been as important as I think they need to be personally. <laughs> I mean, I believe in the running as a receiver. I believe in the running game. I believe in defense. Uh, those things seem to win champions, championships more than not. Um, but I think uh, um, the only point I can really make is that um, if you can, if you have the ability to request contracts like that and they get accepted, uh, you have to go for it because there's one reason why these contracts are, um, are being signed and delivered is because the ownership has the ability to pay for them. And, um, and part of that ability to pay for them is, is to try to win Super Bowls. So um, if it's not, obviously it's not taking anything <laughs> out of their operations, um, but if it's going to get them a step closer to winning a Super Bowl, I mean, uh, that's what you need to do. So you went to UCLA, you played for uh, Terry Donahue. You got the Rose Bowl win there in uh, 82. So I, I just wanted to know, like, what was it like to play for him and, and how did he help your, your overall game? Um, yeah, that was a, had a great experience, college experience there. Um, I think probably the best thing that, First, the first thing that Coach Donnie did for me was just recruited me <laughs> and offered me a scholarship <laughs> to come because that was something I was not expecting. So for him to uh, recruit me, particularly out of Reno, Nevada, because at that time there weren't a lot of recruits coming out of Reno, Nevada. So they found me with the help of my high school football coach and, uh, and I was able to take advantage of it. I think the second thing was that... Uh, what uh, Coach Donahue showed us was the uh, how important your team is. I mean, and your leadership has a lot to do with how you're going to perform, as all you guys know, um, in your own in your own careers. But with football, uh, particularly, I mean, that leadership is so important that if the leadership shows you how to be a team player, it's going to uh, filter down. Uh, to us players and the best thing that coach Donahue did is that when he took a step forward when he knew that he uh, wasn't the best man for the job whether it was to run our offense run our defense he wouldn't found the people to make sure that we could play at a high level he gave the latitude for his assistant coaches to be in charge of things and so you're able to build those relationships and have a great uh, camaraderie not only as players but players with your coaches. And if you have that type of synergism going on the field, well, then you're going to come out and uh, have some successful Saturdays. And, and we did. And we had a lot of, uh, I'm proud to say during those times I was at UCLA, I believe you had, it, it was a competition between us and USC on who had the most players coming out of, uh, out of college to go into the NFL. And UCLA was one of those uh, during the time I was there. We were easily in the top two, I know for sure. And a lot had to do that with Coach Donahue. For Brian, then Rollo. Hi, Jojo. Let, let's go back to December 13th, 1986. Steelers score a touchdown. Gary Anderson kicks the ball off. You field it, and you take it 93 yards to the house. Uh, do you remember the play, and, and how did it feel to score your first NFL touchdown that day? Well, it felt great because I, um, I was a little frustrated at that time as a player, mainly because I, I had a couple of uh, returns that were called back <laughs> uh <-oh. laughs> prior to that. <laughs> and I was like, well, gee whiz, when am I going to get a break here? So, um, so, yeah, that was very exciting. Um, the, uh, we had just an outstanding special teams coach, Larry Pasquale, that um, – you know, again, he's one of those hidden gems that you don't hear about. You know, he never was a head coach or anything like that, but he did his job and he did it at, at you know, like we talked about earlier, Curtis, Curtis Martin level. Um, he prepared us. Our special teams were, we took that very seriously. And 
whatever success I was able to have was be, it started with, with Coach Pasquale. On, I mean, we really game plan just like offense and defense to run schemes, whether it was a kickoff return or trying to block a punt. I mean, we really analyzed that stuff throughout the week to see what could we take advantage of. And, uh, and again, that, that started with leadership with Larry. He taught us how important that we, how we could be on the special team side of the ball. But I don't know if I answered your question, but it was very exciting, of course. Uh, I still have that ball. I've kept that ball, uh, my first NFL touchdown. And uh, it, was, uh, it was great to have that happen. And uh, it was even better that I believe it was on national TV. So my family got to witness that too. So that was pretty cool. Nice. nice. <laughs> Good, Rollo. So you had cut your teeth in the NFL as one of the better return men in the league. Um, but it wasn't until, like, I think it was your fifth, fourth, or fifth season where you played a lot of receiver, where you had over over 700 yards receiving, 17 yards of catch. Why do you think it took so long for you to get that opportunity to show what you can do as a receiver, not just as a return man? Well, it's kind of what we talked about earlier. There were there was a guy named Wesley Walker on one side, <laughs> and there was a guy named Al Toon on the other side. <laughs> so... Uh, you know, there's only one ball. So they were our two primary receivers. And then you alluded to earlier, we had Mickey Schuler uh, also that was involved. Um, and so we had a lot of great offensive talent. So um, to be honest with you, I mean, I got that chance because both Wesley and Al were injured that year, starting the, se starting the season. So I got my chance. So it's just one of those things like a kind of Wayne per bed. I mean, you, you, you stay in tune and you're ready for when your number's called. Uh, I had never lost confidence in myself. The, uh, I think the best thing is with our wide receiver core, I mean, we had Kurt Stone, we had Lamb Jones, we had a lot of great guys. Uh, we all rallied around each other. And during the week, I mean, we really helped each other improve. Um, you know, Alan Wesley got to, got most of the benefit from that, but we really helped each other grow as professional football players by our, our work ethic and our camaraderie, wanting to see each other do well out on the field. So that helped me tremendously to be prepared. And, um, you know, probably the last thing is that, I mean, the, the um, prior to that, I mean, the pump returning, the kickoff returning, I mean, a lot of times all you want to do is just get a shot at the ball. So I look, my approach to the game was that as long as I can get, you know, three to five touches to the ball, I mean, that's all I can ask for. Because if you think about if you play full time as a wide receiver, I mean, especially back then, I, I don't know about now, but, you know, just I'd say the average for a game statistically for a receiver was maybe five, six catches. So I just kind of, what the mindset is that well if I get the you know if I get you know three punts or a couple of kickoffs I just kind of went on that mindset just to kind of make sure that I stayed engaged in the game and uh, and just you know do my part to uh, be part of the team but, well, you, oh sorry go ahead oh I'm sorry but yeah it was it was great to have that chance and uh, again I think it was just all that built up uh and just staying in the core of myself and believing in myself that uh, when I got the chance, I was able to perform. Walter, you got the win, so I'll give you a second question, and then, Brian, you can finish it us out. All right. Um, so I guess my last question for you would be, um, today in the NFL, there's a lot of, like, I want to say – I don't want to say drama per se, but there's a lot of, like, you hear a lot of, like, locker room stories and things of that nature. So – if if you can, can you like explain what you think is the difference between how the locker room was when you were playing compared to how it is now? Yeah, I could say exactly what we're doing right now. Social media. <laughs> 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 when I I uh, my last year was ninety two, and uh, and it was kind of starting from then. And uh, to be honest, I mean we have to kind of. Uh, yeah, I think the Jets probably have any, you know, a lot to do with that, starting with Joe Namath, you know, my teammate Mark Gastineau with his sack dance, <laughs> you know, 
but by the time I started leaving, I could see the change in the players um, on trying to build your brand. And the big reason was, was because, you know, we're talking at the time, and it probably still is that. I haven't seen it in a while, but, you know, the average life expectancy of an NFL player was less than three years. Okay. Wow. So guys knew that, okay, you know, when I get a chance, <laughs> I have to do something to get myself in the spotlight or get noticed because there could be an opportunity off the field. And uh, it wasn't as prevalent then, but that was the start of it. Um, and a lot of it, um, you know, also came from the college game, particularly with the Miami Hurricanes program, how mm -hmm. flamboyant they were. It just kind of like yeah. they were flamboyant, but they also were successful. You know, and uh, let's be honest. I mean, they were bringing some of the urban, you know, some of the street stuff into the game, you know, and just trying right. to have fun. It wasn't trying to show up anyway. It's just, you know, the bottom line is when you're out there, everyone's talking smack. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, I'm not going to talk any smack. I wasn't big enough to talk smacks. So, um, but, uh, um, but to me, no, it's really social media, especially now. Guys know they can build a brand. Um, that might excite a company, whether it's local, regional, or national. Um, they have all these um, outlets from Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, whatever you have. Um, you know, guys have learned the value of marketing themselves. And so, uh, again, I don't believe the life expectancy has gotten up that much, if, if at all, Guys know they have a limited time to uh, have their 15 minutes of fame. So they're going to do what they can to do that, which goes back to your question earlier about, you know, the contracts too. Um, you know, you got to take it when you can. Trust me. Trust me. You take like a Tyreek Hill. Um, trust me. There is no way he can tell anybody that he'd want to leave Patrick Mahomes right now. <laughs> but you still got to look out for what's best for you too. And if you're, you know, if someone's going to pay you what you feel you deserve, I mean, you got to make that decision. So, you know, we have to thank the Freeman McNeils. We have to thank the Reggie Whites for getting us to this point of free agency. Um, I wasn't able to take advantage of that because um, it didn't start till 95. Um, all the free agency stuff. But, but again, uh, it's very important that the guys do what they can um, to leverage as much um, exposure, um, um, you know, career planning, if you will, you know, post-football, because, you know, you can be an Al Toon and not be able to fulfill your true potential, which happens to quite a quite a lot of my, my peers unfortunately um so um but it, it, it's, it really is a social media has changed everything and it's really just helped players today really market themselves and uh and and and, and get their brand out there as, as they want to be seen uh, jojo I, you mentioned it earlier you played three seasons in the usfl with the los angeles express um, what made you, what exactly made you decide to join that league over the NFL? And what was it like playing with a legend like Steve Young? Um, well, really, it, it wasn't that hard of a decision um, because one thing I, I will say, there were only two teams I wanted to get drafted by. Um, the... Uh, that, that the head recruiter for the Jets, Mike Hickey, told me that they were going to draft me. And I was like, great. You know, so uh, I said, if I was going to go outside of California, New York was the place I wanted to go. Um, and then when I came out for the first preseason camp, I mean, it, it you know, it, it reconfirmed that. But, uh, you know, I, uh, to stay in California uh, was just kind of an easy – uh, thing for myself just to make that transition of not just being a college player to a professional player, but just being, um, you know, to start trying to build your career as an adult 
And so I just thought it'd be a lot easier transition for me, but I already know, you know, this landscape here in Southern California. So let's just go with this. I was going to make a little bit more money, not a lot more money, but I did make more money with my initial contract and what the Jets were offering. Um, but again, it had to just do with more with comfort. And, uh, and then playing with someone like Steve, and, you know, the other reason I did go to the Express is that my, my college quarterback, Tom Ramsey, who played with the Patriots, he was a backup to uh, uh, Tony Easton and, and uh, those guys. Um, he, uh, he was the starting quarterback. So he was kind of proud of me to come and let's, let's continue our relationship. So that helped a lot. And then, then the, the following year, you know, we, we uh, the team signed Steve, and, uh, and, uh, and th that was great. Um, if there's anything that I, if there's anything um, from a Jets standpoint that I wish we could have done more, um, at least had more latitude, it's a different time. It might, it might've changed at this point, And I think it has, but back, uh, back when we were talking the eighties, I mean, still NFL coaches pretty much had a tight handle, particularly offensively on what, what plays are going to be run. But I know, you know, uh, when we talked about Terry Donahue in college and then we had Hugh Campbell and John Hato as coaches at Los Angeles Express, they did give us the latitude to, if we saw something in the defense, that we can, we can make the audible. We didn't have to okay it with the coaches. And uh, it better work. <laughs> and it did. It only didn't work one time uh, between Steve and I, and that's only because we – we didn't, we, we messed up on how I needed him to throw the ball, but um, we corrected it very quickly. But Steve was, a, was great to play with. Um, just a fun guy, guy, one of the most athletically talented people. I mean, he could play a number of positions that would have been a Hall of Fame player. Uh, but as a quarterback, um, he showed the kind of leadership you want at the position, uh, the toughness, and uh, he was just a great teammate and, you know, we're still really good teammates to this day. Um, and uh, um, he was just a joy to be around. So my express uh, experience was awesome. And uh, it would have been great if it kept going. I understand what, are they starting a new league this year? They, come they are. Yeah. They are. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, um, there's so many really good football players out there. Um that uh, you just hope you have a chance to get into an organization that appreciates that. And, and if there's anything I can say to my career is that everywhere I went from college to the, you know, the Express to the Jets, uh, I did feel that appreciation that at least they were going to give me a chance to um, showcase my talents. And, and I, felt I feel very comfortable with what I was able to achieve as a professional football player. Well, we want to thank Jojo Townsend for joining us tonight. Awesome to have a Jet on here. Always a good time when we get when we get the Jets on. Thank you for uh, giving us uh, giving us a little light on some of those Jets players. We appreciate you being here. Well, thank you guys for the opportunity, and you know, thank you guys for continuing to be you know, supporting football um, and particularly supporting the Jets. You know, it's been some tough times, but uh, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna get there. <laughs> we're gonna get there eventually but uh again that, that was if there's anything i appreciated being a new york jet is how much i know the fans appreciated you know us representing the city there so i mean i um i mean again it was i it was a second to none experience for me so i enjoyed the heck out of it well I'll remind everybody hit that subscribe button or whatever you're listening on we'll see you next time thank you for watching have a great night